Hi, welcome to Chapter 8, Development Across the Lifespan. These are the objectives we'll be covering. I'm not going to read them for you. There's a little video here, how have you changed since your teenage years. Um, today we're going to look at um, some of the changes that people make throughout the lifespan from birth, or actually from prenatal until death. Um, first of all, human development is a scientific study of the changes that occur in people as they age from conception until death. Um, longitudinal, longitudinal design is, involves research design in which one participant or group of participants is studied over a long period of time. Um, the advantage or maybe the disadvantage of long-term research is you gain what's called a cohort effect. Um, it's an impact on development when a group of people share a common time period or life experience. So basically, if you're studying people who grow up at a similar time period, they have similar experiences. Um, to overcome the cohort effect, we have what's called cross-sectional design, where the research design is in several different age groups of participants. They're studied at one particular point in time. Um, Cross-sequential design uh, combines both. We have research design in which participants are first studied by means of a cross-sectional design, but also followed and assessed over a period of no more than six years. So it has the best of uh, both worlds, a cross-section of ages, uh, cross-section of time periods, uh, over a period of time. So this is a little comparison of the three types of uh, research design, cross-sectional, longitudinal, and cross-sequential design. Next um, is the big question, is it nature or nurture that made Hitler the person he was? Uh, basically, um, psychology has come to the conclusion that all people are and all people become is the product of interaction between both nature and nurture. Um, especially recently in behavioral genetics is a new field and they like using identical twins as subjects because they have similar DNA. Um, but with studies of nature, um, basically you're looking at um, genetics, the influence of our inherited characteristics in our personality, our physical growth, our intellectual growth and social interactions. Where nurture, the focus is on the influence of the environment, on our personality, physical growth, intellectual growth, and social interactions. Um, the term behavioral genetics is a new field that focuses on nature over nurture. Uh, there's a cool video here on uh, the twin studies, which basically shows that it's more nurture than nature. Uh, genetics is the science of inherited traits, where they look at um, behavioral genetics and what is the effect of um, that passing on um, certain traits. Um, first of all, we look at uh, the gene called the DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, it's a special molecule that contains the genetic material of the organism. Uh, if you look at, um, click this link, you'll see interactive uh, map of dominant and recessive genes in PKU, PKU which is a disease that's passed on um, genetically. Here it shows a mother, let's say the mother has a recessive gene and the father does not carry the gene, okay? The result, no child will be affected with this disease, PKU, although two and four will carry the recessive gene. So this figure shows the variation of parents carrying one or two recessive genes and the result of this in their offspring. So if only one parent carries a PKU gene, their children might be carriers, but they won't have PK, PKU themselves. This figure shows variation of parents carrying one or two recessive genes and the results of this in their offspring. Uh, if you look at figure B, um, only if both parents are carriers of PKU will a child have the one in four possibility of having PKU. This model is a model of a DNA molecule. Notice there's a double helix, two strands um, making up the sides of the twisted ladder and are composed of sugar and phosphates. The rungs of the ladder that link the two strands are aminase. Um, aminase contain the um, genetic codes for building the proteins that make up organic life. 
So the gene is a section of DNA that has a certain pattern of chemical elements. The dominant gene is a gene that actively controls the expression of the trait. The recessive gene is a gene that only influences the expression of a trait when paired with an identical gene. Let's take a look at um, chromosome, which is a tightly worn strand of genetic material or DNA. A chromosomal disorder includes um, Down syndrome, Kleinfelter syndrome, and Turner syndrome. Kleinfelter is where you have the extra X chromosome um, in the male uh, DNA. Turner syndrome is where the, the X chromosome is missing in the female DNA. Uh, there's genetic disorders that include PKU, cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis sickle cell anemia, and Tay-Sachs disease. And um, this is just a summary of human development with this concept map. Let's talk about development from conception. That's the moment in which a female becomes pregnant, when the sperm meets the ovum or the egg. Um, and that's when fertilization occurs. That's when the ovum and sperm meet and conception occurs. Um, the zygote is a cell that results from the uniting of the ovum and sperm. It divides and then divides into many cells, eventually forming the baby. A uh, cool thing that happens right at the moment of consumption is um, the possibility of twins. Uh, monozygotic twins is when one zygote splits into two separate masses of cells, each of which develops into a separate embryo. Dizygotic twins, um, often called fertile twins, they occur when two eggs, there are two separate eggs that get fertilized by two separate sperm, resulting in development of two separate and unique zygotes in uterus at the same time. So with identical twins, um, it's one egg and one, one egg, one sperm. They divide and split into two, forming two identical genetic, um, ge genetically similar um, siblings. Or fraternal twins is two separate eggs, two separate sperms, forming two separate um, DNA genetically different um, siblings. Um, so here you may have a boy and a girl, or here they are, the, they'll be the same gender. So because identical twins come from one fertilized egg or zygote, they're called monozygotic. Um, fraternal twins who come from two different fertilized eggs are called dizygotic. Next is the germinal period. This is the first two weeks after fertilization during which a zygote moves down the uterus and begins to implant in the lining. The embryo is a name for the developing organism from two weeks to eight weeks after fertilization. The embryonic period is a period from two to eight weeks after fertilization, during which the major organs and structures of the organisms develop. This is called the critical period. There's different times which certain environmental influence can have an impact on the development of the infant. For instance, from three and a half to eight weeks um, is structural development. Arms and legs are formed. From two and a half to six and a half weeks, the heart structure is formed. From two to five weeks, the central nervous system is formed. Um, during these times, um, any um, things that happen is called ter teratogen. It's any factor that can cause a birth defect. Um, so if uh, any alcohol use or um, any um, heavy metals or anything like that can really in the bloodstream can really uh, mess up the child's development. These are different uh, ter teratogenic uh, agents and the effects on development. So if uh, marijuana can cause these things, cocaine, alcohol, nicotine, they have different effects on the baby's development. Could lead to learning disabilities, uh, blindness, um, deafness, miscarriage, uh, higher incidence of can uh, cancer or physical deformities. So there's a lot of uh, serious consequences um, of being exposed to these things during critical times. Next is the fetal period. This is a time from about eight weeks after conception until the birth of the child. Uh, this is where it's no longer called an embryo um, or embryonic cell. The, the, the baby forming in the womb is called a fetus. 
Um, that's the name for the developing organism from eight weeks till after fertilization to the birth of the baby. There's a term called viability, which is a point at which, it's or which it is possible for the infant to survive outside the womb. It's usually 22 to 26 weeks. Uh, so a baby that is viable can survive outside the womb. And there's a nice little concept map on prenatal development. Next, uh, infants are born with reflexes that help them survive. The moment the child is born, um, they have a grasping reflex, a startle reflex, a rooting reflex, a stepping reflex, and a sucking reflex. So these are automatically programmed into the baby. They're inborn instinctual behavior, which um, most behavior for humans is learned except for these um, infant uh, behaviors. First of all, shown here are the grasping reflex. See the baby grasping the finger. The startle reflex. Um, some people call it also the moral reflex. Uh, maybe this has to go back in a time when we lived in trees, where um, if we have the feeling we're falling, we startle and break out our arms, and hopefully um, something catches us or we catch a branch. The rooting reflex is when you touch a baby's cheek, it'll turn towards your hand, open its mouth, and search for the mom's nipple. That's uh, the rooting reflex. Uh, the next is the uh, um, stepping reflex, that babies automatically move their feet forward and step if you kind of walk them along. Um, next is the sucking reflex. Anything in their mouth, they'll start sucking. Um, these infant reflexes can be used to check the health of the infant's nervous system. If this natural reflex is absent or abnormal, it may indicate brain damage or some other neurological problems. So you, so you can test this with a baby from the moment they're born, these reflexes. Um, next, shown here are other uh, milestones. One is raising their head and chest at two to four months. Uh, figure B is rolling over two to five months, and C is sitting up with support four to six months. Okay, I know what you're thinking. All oh, these babies are so cute. I gotta have a baby. I know a lot of you are very young. Please, please, please. If you haven't already, which is, it's okay. Uh, but please, if you haven't already, uh, hold off on having children until after you finish your education. Um, from my experiences, uh, working with a lot of young moms, it's, it's a lot harder road um, raising children and um, going to school at the same time. So um, you know what causes children. Um, please uh, plan accordingly. Um, try to force um, to hold off on having, raising a family until you finish your education. For those of you who have uh, children, it's a very honorable thing to be a parent. Um, and it's also honorable to go to school at the same time. Some more milestones. Uh, sitting up without support, six to seven months. Um, crawling, seven to eight months. Walking, eight to 18 months. Um, these motor milestones develop as the infant gains greater voluntary control over the muscles in his body, his or her body, typically from the top of the body downward. The pattern is seen in the early control of the neck muscles and much later development of the control of legs and the feet. Next, uh, the senses, except for vision, are fairly well developed at birth. Um, so babies cannot see very well from the moment they're born. Um, also, when they're born, uh, something called synaptic pruning happens, where the unused synaptic connections and nerve cells are cleared away to make way for functioning connections and cells. So in other words, they're, they're making room for new development. Uh, cognitive development is the development of thinking, uh, problem solving, and memory. Jean Piaget, a uh, French psychologist, developed a four stage, or physician, developed a four stage theory of cognitive development based on his observation of um, infants and children. He came up with the term schemes or mental concepts are formed by children as they experience new situations and events. And there's a little video here on Piaget's stages of development. Um, the four stages have to do with sensor motor, which is birth at two years old. And this is where the children explore their world using their senses and ability. Everything goes in the mouth. They develop object permanence and understand that concepts and mental images 
represent objects, people, and events. This is where you do the peekaboo, you put your hands over your face, you no longer exist. They don't see you. And then that's all exciting when you introduce your face again. So peekaboo is exciting. That's uh, the permanent thing. If they don't see it, it doesn't exist. Pre-operational is uh, two to seven years old. This is where they mentally represent and refer to objects and events with words and pictures. So this is where they acquire language. However, they can't conserve logically reason or simultaneously consider many characteristics. And we're going to talk more about that in the next uh, future slides. Concrete opera operations, seven to 12 years old. Here, where they're able to conserve, reverse their thinking and classify objects in terms of their many characteristics. They also begin to think logically and understand analogies, uh, but only about concrete events. Formal operations is 12 years to uh, adulthood. This is where they can use formal abstract reasoning, and they can think about hypothetical events or situations, think about logical possibilities. This is where you think about ideal world. Um, they use abstract analogies, systematically explain and test hypotheses, uh, not everyone can eventually reason in these ways. Usually they learn this um, in college or formal education. So again, sensor motor stage is the first stage. The infant uses his nerve sensors and motor abilities. Um, and object permanence is the object um, knowledge that the object exists even when it's not in sight. And so they don't have that yet. Uh, Pre-operational stage is the second stage in which preschool child learns to use language and as a means of exploring the world. There's a lot of what's called egocentrism. In other words, the child's inability to see the world through anyone else's eyes but their own. In other words, uh, they are in the center of their own universe. Centration is in Piaget's theory, the tendency of the young child to focus only on one feature of an object while ignoring other relevant features. Pre-operational stage, um, a term uh, Piaget used was conservation. The ability to understand that simply changing the appearance of an object does not change the object's nature. And the next screen will show a little more about this. Irreversibility in Piaget's theory is the inability of a young child to mentally re reverse an action. Um, this is, shows an example of uh, uh, conservation. So you have two equal glasses of liquid. And you pour one in front of the child, you pour the same glass into a taller, narrower glass. And you ask the question, which glass contains more water? And the child in a pre-operational stage will say, this one, the taller one. Or you have two equal lines of pennies in front of the child. You just space the pennies out in one line. And you ask them which line has more pennies, and of course it's the longer one. So a typical conservation task consists of pouring equal amounts. Um, so I guess I explained that already. Um, so when the pennies in the top line are spaced out, the child who cannot yet conserve will concentrate on the top line and assume there are actually more pennies in that line. Um, concrete operation stage. Uh, Piaget did not think all people reached the formal operation stage. Uh, but the concrete operations stage uh, is the third stage of development in which a school age child becomes capable of logical thought and processes, but not yet capable of formal abstract thinking. Piaget's last cognitive development, which adolescent becomes capable of abstract thinking. Um, this relativistic thinking stage is often fostered in college who find the old black and white thinking challenged with new problems that cannot be solved with pure logic. <clears throat> and they actually move on to the next stage. So test yourself in Piaget stages. That's kind of a cool little test you can click. Scaffolding. Uh, Vygotsky's theory of scaffolding um, is a process by which a more skilled learner gives help to a less skilled learner, then reduces the amount of help as a less skilled learner becomes more capable. Capable. For instance, an older sibling can be a key to helping a younger sibling learn new skills. Um, by process of uh, scaffolding. Uh, Vygotsky's uh, other theory is the zone of proximal development, CPD. That's the difference between what a child can do alone and what the child can do with the help of the teacher. Um, private speech, uh, Vygotsky viewed this as a way for a child to think out loud and advance cognitively. 
Um, from this, many teachers use a strategy called think alones. It's a metacognition strategy where teachers explain what they're thinking as they walk students through a new concept, a new skill or behavior. Uh, for instance, if I'm in a job interview, I will think to myself, okay, I'm going to be positive, um, make sure I give a firm handshake, um, dress for success. You know, these are, you walk them through what you think, what you're thinking. Next, language development allows children to think in words rather than images, um, encourages them to ask questions, to communicate their needs, to form concepts. Um, this is where you have child directed speech, children attend higher pitch, repetitious sing song speech. Um, so, this is beginning level of language. Um, the different levels are cooing, babbling, one word speech, uh, telegraphic speech, and whole sentences. Um, Cooing is just where they're making the noises, babbling, or, or trying to mimic what you're saying. Uh, one word speech is where a kid might say one word like milk, meaning I drank my milk or I want some milk. Telegraphic speech is where we start, you know, um, adding more, more words. Uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, that's a developmental disorder encompassing a range of problems in thinking, feeling, language, and social skills. There's a lot of myths connected with uh, autism spectrum disorder. And vaccines, have, vaccines have been thoroughly debunked. Um, first of all, autism has increased from one in 110 people in 2006 to one in 88 in 2015. Now, don't panic. There's not a rise in autism, only an increase due to an expansion of the definition of what autism is and an improvement in diagnosis of autism cases. So the increases is not because there's more autism. It's just what they count as autism has been expanded. Now, a man named Wakefield in 1998, he published studies linking autism to subjects receiving MMR vaccine. Um, however, he used a sample in a study of only 12 children and no control groups. The studies were denounced as inadequate and dangerous, uh, and his medical license was revoked for falsifying his data. So this was totally bogus uh, research, and as a result, uh, many families refused to um, um, inoculate their children with the vaccine. As a result, uh, the measles epidemics um, from parents refusing to immunize their children. So please uh, debunk that myth if you ever hear anyone share this. Um, temperament is uh, behavioral characteristics that are fairly well established at birth. You might have a baby that's easy, regular, adaptable, and happy. Oh, what a well-behaved baby. Or you might have what's called a difficult temperament. They're irregular non-adaptable and irritable and some are slow to warm up in other words they need to adjust gradually to change uh, same thing with attachment um, this is your emotional bond between the infant and caregiver you may have a secure attachment where the baby is willing to explore uh, they get upset when mother departs but easily soothes upon her return the avoidant attachment is unattached um, they explore without touching base now, Mary Ainsworth in 1885 came up with these through what's called their stranger situation study, um, where um, the stranger came into the room and they viewed the, how the baby reacted. The ambivalent attachment style is where the child is insecurely attached. Uh, the child is upset when the mother leaves and then angry with the mother upon her return. Um, disorganized attachment is uh, where the child is, appears disoriented, insecurely attached, and sometimes maybe abused or neglected. The child seems fearful, dazed, and depressed. Um, this could be related to childhood trauma as well. Um, Harlow, in 1958, came up with what's called uh, the monkey experiment. In his experiment, um, the wire surrogate mother provides food for this infant recess monkey, but the infant spends all of its time with a soft cloth covered surrogate, even though this one does not provide food. So according to Harlow, this demonstrates the importance of contact, comfort, and attachment. 
Now, how might the implications of Harlow's work for human mothers who feed their infants with bottles rather than breastfeeding um, have implications? Um, he also actually took this a step further um, where they didn't bond at all, um, didn't have the soft cloth colored surrogate. What happened is the rhesus monies, uh, monkeys stopped developing um, to the point where they lost um, their instinctual behavior. Um, where they could not even be uh, function well in when they returned to the wild. Um, so that was kind of scary. That is a need for uh, bonding. Now, self concept is image you have of yourself. Now, based on your interactions with important people of your life, um, how has that affected your self concept? Remember, you are the sum of your interactions with others. Now, this study by Amsterdam in 1972, um, he did what's called the rouge test. He put lipstick on the baby's nose, and the baby was placed in front of a mirror. At six months to one year, the baby reacted as if the image were another child, even trying to look behind the mirror to find the child. Um, at 15 to 18 months, the baby touched her own nose, seeing the image in the mirror, thus, you know, proving that... Um, it was like a, a realization of themselves. Uh, Erickson, he came up with uh, psychosocial stages of development in 1950. Um, kind of a, a reaction or extension of what um, uh, Freud did. He was a student of Freud's. Um, he, he came up with the first stage as trust versus mistrust. The first stage of personality development where the infant has a basic sense of trust or mistrust developing as a result of consistent or inconsistent care. So this is where it's important not to let the baby cry it out. If a baby's crying, this is an instinctive reaction to the baby's needs, hunger, thirst, pain, loneliness, and it's important you basically take care of the baby. Now, if the baby's been checked, you know, fed, diaper changed, and burped, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with some crying, but for the most part, you know, respond to the crying because it's an instinctive reaction to the baby needing something. Um, now, autonomy versus shame and doubt is the second stage where the toddler strives for physical independence. This is where they learn to walk and move around and feel independent. Now, initiative versus guilt is the third stage of personality development. This is where the preschool child strives for emotional and psychological independence and attempts to satisfy his or, satisfy his or her curiosity about the world. Now the next stage is industry versus inferiority. The fourth stage of personality development, the adolescent strives for a sense of self-competence and self-esteem. There is a few concept maps on development to review these concepts. Um, this shows the four stages. And I'm not going to read these to you because we kind of went over them. Next is gender development. Gender is the psychological aspects of being male or female. Uh, Rayner in 2000 did a study of 25 genetically male children with ambiguous genitalia who were surgically altered and raised as girls. So you have 25 males, their DNA is male. But they cut off their gen genitalia because it was ambiguous. And they said, raise these child as children as girls. Now, as teenagers, they prefer to play male activities. 14 out of 25 have uh, since openly declared to be boys. Um, can you imagine how traumatic that would be? Uh, one of the kids um, actually died to suicide because of uh, a hard time adjusting to um, this uh, genetic gender identity. Um, gender roles are our cultural expectations regarding the behavior of a person who is perceived as male or female, including actions, attitudes, personality traits associated. Now, gender identity is that sense of being male or female. Now, social learning theory is the emphasis on learning through observation and imitation. Um, a study by uh, Fagan and Hagen, that's an unfortunate name, um, studied same-sex parents' uh, re reaction to their children's gender-specific behavior. And what they found is that um, the parents rewarded the 
children for appropriate gender behavior, and they ignored or discouraged um, gender inappropriate behavior. Um, the next is uh, gender schema theory. Um, BEM in 1987 um, found that children develop a schema of, of understand themselves as a boy or a girl and acquire their gender role by the age of, already by the age of one. So children develop these schemas early on that they are male or female and they can detect male and female faces, male and female voices already by the age one. Now androgyny is the gender role characteristic of people whose personalities reflect the characteristics of both male and female, regardless of gender. And here's some more concept maps on gender development. Now adolescence is a period of life from about age 13 to the early 20s, during which a young person is no longer physically a child, but is not yet an independent, self-supporting adult. Um, Puberty is the physical changes that occur in the body as the sexual development reaches its peak. And this is a period of about four years. Now remember, the brain um, does not finish developing until the age of 25. And that's according to Somerville in 2013. So technically, adolescence goes into late adolescence uh, up until 25 when the brain finishes developing. Now, adolescents, unfortunately, are often risk takers. Um, and this has to do with part of their programming. Um, it also makes them vulnerable to sexually transmitted diseases, um, called STDs or STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, chlamydia has, has grown, uh, oops, chlamydia has grown significantly in Omaha. If you look at this link here, um, it's, it's almost epidemic proportions. Um, syphilis, gonorrhea, herpes, and AIDS um, also are, um, it's, it's spread mostly among kids um, 18 to 25. If you click this link, it's some scary stuff about, oh, I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, and some scary stuff about um, sexually transmitted diseases in, our, in this area. Omaha, Nebraska. Um, formal operations um, may begin to emerge in adolescence. Piaget's uh, final stage is called abstract formal reasoning. This is where um, the adolescent can think in hypothetical situations. They can um, picture an ideal world. And, um, this, uh, this group tends to be more idealistic of what the world can be. Um, however, one's had a little more idealistic. On the other hand, they could also still be egocentric, um, taking a lot of selfies and be preoccupied with their own thoughts. Um, <laughs> David Elkind's um, book from Egocentrism in Adolescence in 1967 came up with these terms, personal fable. One is where young people believe themselves to be unique and protected from harm. Um, they believe that all things are unique to me. Nothing happens to anyone else like it does to me. Nobody understands me. Um, and then the imaginary audience is where young people believe that other people are just as concerned about the adolescent thoughts and characteristics as they are. So they believe that multitudes of people are enthusiastically listening to them or watching them. Um, now remember, this came out in 67, which was long before cell phones and social media and Facebook and everything like that. Uh, maybe the um, Facebook really applies to the imaginary audience. So if a kid falls and only a couple people see it, they might feel like the whole world watched and the whole world laughed. When in reality, it was just a couple people. Um, Lawrence Colburn came up with what's called levels of morality in 1973. He used hypothetical moral dilemmas um, to come up with these different levels. Now, um, critiques of these levels is uh, what people say they might do in a hypothetical situation may be different from what they may actually do in real life. Um, Carol Gilligan also refuted that men and women have different perspectives on morality. Uh, jury's still out, it really hasn't been tested, but she said that men have an ethics of fairness, where women have an ethics of care that trumps fairness. And they tend to be more nonviolent and hurt fewer people. But um, children are usually at 
conventional morality where behavior is governed by consequences. Conventional morality where behavior is governed by conforming to society's norms. For instance, when my son was in uh, fifth grade, he was at conventional mor morality. And I said, we're biking to school. You're taking your bike to school. And he says, but dad, it says in a handbook, do not bring your bikes to school. And I said, son, that is a dumb rule. You're riding your bike to school. And he melted down all the way to school, did not. Um, felt it was, it was at the law and order stage that this was a rule that should not be broken. Um, now the post-conventional morality is where behavior is governed by moral principles that have been decided by the individual. They may be in disagreement with accepted social norms. So I believe I was at post-conventional morality saying it's a dumb rule, Henry, we can just go to school without a bike or go to school with a bike in spite of the rules where he was at stage two and said, but dad, you're breaking the rules. Do you understand the difference? Okay. Um, this shows levels of morality. We just went over these three, but it has gives some good examples of um, each of the more um, levels. Next, uh, Erickson's fifth stage is identity versus role confusion. And this is the fifth stage um, where the adolescent must find consistent sense of self. Now, this is where you have what's called a parent-teen conflict. Um, they, we've learned that peers who have resolved the first four stages are better equipped to resist peer pressure. Now, peer pressure is effective on those who desperately want to fit in. Uh, Bengston in 1970 said parent-teen um, conflict some rebellion is necessary in breaking away from childhood dependence and becoming a self-sufficient adult. Um, so at this stage, this is where adults who are unable to define themselves remain confused, or they'll learn to define their values, goals, and beliefs. Adulthood begins in their early 20s and ends with old age and death. That sounds kind of depressing, doesn't it? Um, it's, uh, adulthood is divided into young adulthood, middle adulthood, and late adulthood. However, there's a new term called emerging adulthood. I guess it sounds better than late adolescence. And this is a time from late adolescence through the 20s, um, where the person is still childless, do they, do, they do not live at home. However, they're not earning enough to be dependent. Women experience a physical decline in the reproductive system in, in um, adulthood called climacteric. Um, it ends about age 50 with menopause, with the end of ov ovulation and menstrual cycles, and the end of women's reproductive capability. Um, sometimes women look forward to this change. Um, sometimes they have um, called, uh, something called heat. What is it called? Um, heat things. Well, I'm sorry, it's late. I'm forgetting. Um, um, but they, they have a change in temperature and stuff like that, um, or sensitivity to temperature. Men experience andropause, which are gradual changes in sexual hormones and reproductive system as well. Um, there's increase in health problems as uh, we get older. Um, I notice is from 40s to 50s, there's a, a longer um, period of time to recover from physical activity. So if I play um, sports or racquetball or soccer, um, instead of recovering in a day, I might take five days to recover. Not like not able to work, but just feeling the pain of what happened. Um, there's also a decrease in reaction time. There's challenges in memory, like I just showed a few minutes ago. Um, they're more likely to be caused by stress and high volumes of information to maintain. Next is the uh, final stage. I'm sorry, the, the second last stage, the last of three stages for Erickson is intimacy versus isolation. This is where a young adult is dealing with emotional and psychological closeness that's based on ability to trust, share, and care while still not losing themselves. Generativity versus stagnation is providing guidance to one's children or next generation, uh, being able to contribute to the well-being of the next generation. Um, your book talks about different parenting styles. This comes from Diana 
Bomb Rhine, uh, 1991. Um, there's author authoritarian parenting. This is where you focus on rules and law and order. Um, usually, it's, that me implies being too strict of a parent. Um, permissive parenting is the opposite, where you let your little angel do whatever they want. Um, sometimes they call that free range parenting. And then there's permissive, um, neglectful parenting. That's where you don't care about your kid, you don't take care of your kid. They can do whatever they want. Permissive indulgent is, I guess this would be more like permissive uh, free range, where I'm taking care of the kid, but I'm giving them a lot more parameters, um, freedom to kind of explore the world around them. Growing up for me, I was able to do whatever I want, um, just be home by dark. Um, that would, I think that was more of a free range kid. I think I turned out okay. Um, my kids, not so much, because uh, we I live in the country and we can do whatever we want. Um, in the city, there's a lot more fear of strangers and um, lock the door and you get home from school, that type of stuff. Um, authoritative, authoritative parents is kind of more of a democratic parent where you set some boundaries, but you also give them parameters for, you know, reaching out and being themselves. And there's a little video here on parenting styles you can watch. Finally, uh, the last stage is ego, integrity versus despair, where there's a sense of wholeness that comes from having lived a full life, an ability to let go of regrets, the final completion of the ego. So there's some kind of life review that happens in late adulthood where you must deal with mistakes, regrets, and unfinished business. And when they come to terms with this, a feeling of integrity or wholeness results. In other words, they don't get um, bent over, you know, small, finer particulars of life. Like some people I know. <laughs> okay. um, this is just a summary of the final stages that we just went over. This is derived from Erickson, 1950. There is different theories of age, and one is called the cellular clock theory, that your cells are like a ticking time bomb, that they can only reproduce and um, repair themselves for so long. Um, Hayflick in 1977 said, cells are limited in the number of times they reproduce, or and they lose their ability to repair damage. Martin and Buckwalter reaffirmed this in 2001. He showed the existence of what's called telomeres, structures on the end of our chromosomes that shorten each time a cell reproduces. Then there's wear and tear theory is that, that as time goes by, repeated use and abuse of the body, tissues um, cause it to be unable to repair all the damage. The free radical theory is that oxygen molecules with an unstable electron move around our cells, damaging cell structures as they go. So organs and cells eventually wear out from um, oxidation. Activity theory, on the other hand, says that there's a theory of adjustment that goes in, goes to aging that assumes older people are happier if they remain active in some way or another, such as volunteering or developing a hobby. And that's from Havinghurst in 1968. So an active retired person will be happier and thus healthier and most likely live longer because they have purpose. Elizabeth Kubler Ross talks about stages of grief. Um, her latest research is uh, 1997. Um, she says that most people facing death go through all these denial or shock, and then anger, then bargaining, then depression, then acceptance. Criticisms of this stage theory is that each person's dying process is unique. Um, there's really no right or wrong way to go through death. Um, but these are some common stages that people experience. Um, and also, um, this theory is uh, pretty strongly tied to Western culture. And in your book, they have like a cross-cultural uh, view of uh, how other people deal with death. While well, Westerners see a person as either dead or alive, in some cultures, a person who by Western standards is clearly alive is mourned as already dead. As, this, as is the case in many Native American cultures. Think about how has your own experience with a family member's death affected you, affected you and your outlook in life? 
What were your cultural trappings of the days leading up to the death and our funeral arrangements? Um, how do you celebrate the, the life of somebody who's passed away? How do your customs, how may they differ from, let's say, Hindu or Cheyenne customs, as mentioned in your book? Well, this concludes our session. Uh, have a great week.